Amazing. We are ready to go. Just waiting for Katya and Michaela to hop on here. Hey, Michaela. Hello. Hi. And Katya. Hi, Katya. Hi. How are you? Doing great. How are you? I'm good. Um, okay, so let's just get started. So for anyone who does not know me, my name is Rachel Lyons. I'm the Executive Director of Space for Humanity, and I'm really excited to be having this Q&A today. Um, the team and myself has been getting so many questions about applications and people who are curious or asking if they should apply. And um, so the goal of this meeting is, is for us to share a little bit about the process and, and also Katya as someone who's applied to this, um, you know, a little bit about what it, what it was like from your end. So I'll just quickly go ahead and introduce everyone. I think I don't need to spend too much time introducing Katya. I think everyone here probably knows her, but Katya, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, especially as it relates to your work with Space for Humanity? Sure. So hi, everybody. My name is Katya, and I am Space for Humanity's first citizen astronaut. Since this experience, we've been working very hard to be able to make it better for anybody and everybody that comes along next. So we're very excited about the future of Space for Humanity and that how you can actually come and incorporate yourself, your dreams, your goals with the common goal that Space for Humanity also has. So we are super happy to be here today to be able to just share everything that we've already experienced with this amazing organization and answer any questions that you might have about how you can get involved yourself. Mm -hmm. Yay, thank you. Um, and Michaela, she is our Director of Human Experience. She's currently calling in from Egypt. Um, and Michaela also leads our selection process. So if you guys have questions about selection process, she is the person to talk to. Michaela, do you want to quickly introduce yourself as well? Sure. As Rachel mentioned, I'm located in Egypt right now. So excuse the car horns in the background. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, there are so many questions that we're going to be addressing today, and I'm excited as well to see all the new ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and I'll just say um, before we dive in, um, uh, just a housekeeping item, and then Michaela, maybe you can chime in with that. We've got a Q and A box, so if you guys, you know, something comes to mind and you really want to know the answer to it, feel free to just throw that in the Q and A. Um, Michaela, is there anything else? Any other housekeeping items? Um, no, we'll go over those Q and A questions a little bit later in the segment. Um, and we did want to mention that if there are any inappropriate ones, um, they just won't be brought up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Keep it, let's, we'll keep it PG, everybody. Keep it lighthearted. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so um, with that, Katya, I know you've talked a few times about the application process, um, you know, and there's been some, since you applied in 2019, of course, it's evolved a bit, but I do think that, um, you know, there's some things that are, that are similar. Like, I know that you talk a lot about how, you know, you didn't think that you could get it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot there that I think probably people listening could relate to. So do you want to just say a few words to what the process was like for you? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, I actually applied during the very first uh, application that came out back in 2019. And so for me, this was actually about a three year long process. Well, for me and for Space for Humanity, <laughs> it was a, a three year long process. And I remember that um, when I came across this application, it was actually the very last day that it was open. And I hadn't really heard anything about it. Somebody sent it along. And I remember I got so excited and I set aside whatever I was doing. And I said, I'm going to apply for this in the next few hours. This is what I'm going to do. And it was a series of essays. Think of it kind of like a different type of college application, right? Where you have to really show sure your, your accomplishments and your experience um, academically and work experience, but also who you are as a person in a more well-rounded way. Here, particularly the goal is to find individuals that are very passionate about social work, about activism, about being humanitarians, because Space for Humanity, the main goal here is what if 
we sent people that were already activists to space to have this overview effect experience? What if we planted them all over the world? What kind of change can we actually see in the world um, from all of these individuals with this shared experience? And so personally, I was terrified of applying. I did not ever think, it's funny, I like to say that when you're applying for go to space, you're not expecting to go to space <laughs> because that is how far away you see it. But it's always been really important for me to just give it a shot, to just try, because I just don't like that feeling of years later, knowing that this is something that I had in front of me, that I had this opportunity in front of me and that I decided not to do it, whether out of fear or whether out of not feeling good enough. So for me, just giving it a shot was enough. And I really hope that you will feel Similarly, again, if you are not able to get it the first time around and apply again and apply again, I mean, this isn't a you apply one time and that's it, you can never apply ever again. What we also really like to see is growth and change and all of us evolve as as people over time so definitely. I would say it is not as scary as you might think. <laughs> All of us are very nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. All of us here, if we could, we would send absolutely everybody <laughs> that is interested in going to space. So um, just think of it as, a, as an opportunity for you to really just show the organization and show the world what it is you want to do about any of the issues that you're currently seeing and facing. Mm -hmm. um, the interview process was also very straightforward. I was notified about the interview uh, within, I believe within the next day, we already had our first pre-call. And then within two days, I was already doing my interview. The notification um, of being told who was selected was also very quick, um, definitely less than a week, which is usually about what it takes for, you know, when you're gonna hear back for a job. And I appreciate that so much because when you are waiting, right after doing an interview and you're waiting on this, you know that you're gonna to be torturing yourself for the next few days until you find <laughs> out. So that quickness is appreciated. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I love it. Okay. We're already getting so many questions as well. So this is great. Um, I'll, I'll answer. So people are asking, do you give preference over applicants without STEM degrees? And then someone else asked, um, someone else asked the opposite of that, which is, it seems that many applicants come from science backgrounds. Is it like, basically, is it okay if people come from different fields, have no background in science? So that was Anna. And then the other one was from Hope. Um, I can just answer that quickly in that we it, we don't care. We don't care if you're a PhD astrophysicist or, you know, you studied, a, I don't know, social, something social in school or, you know, you're an artist. Or you didn't or, study at all. Or you, or you didn't study at all. Exactly. So we really, we're open to everyone. Um, and I wouldn't say that like your degrees or what you studied or what your field is, that's not going to impact our selection of you. Um, what we're looking for, as Katya said, is really people who are passionate about whatever it is and people who can share this experience with um, with their community. So I'm going to go ahead and click that we answered these questions live. Um, and then I'll just share a little bit about our, more about our program. And Katya, if you want to chime in because you went through it. Um, so, of course, we selected, we did pre-flight training, so to help Katya prepare for the experience. Um, she went to space, she came back down and we supported her in integrating it, which means like really making sense of it into your life. It's like when you go, um, you know, you know, you travel to a new country, you, and then you come back, it's like you had this new experience and life doesn't look the same after that. And so we really want to help you in, in creating like, what does life look like, like for you now? And then we have the impact portion of our program, which Katya has done such an incredible job of, you know, creating incredible ripple effects that also, I don't think you could have predicted Katya prior to going to space. Like Katya and I, we were together two weekends ago and we were laughing because we were looking at her intake forms. And she said that her goal was at like the intake form when she was selected, she was like, my goal is to, you know, speak publicly and share my story with more people, which we were laughing because I think you've done 100x that and you know you were on the cover of Vogue Mexico and 
you know, you're constantly speaking and sharing and being interviewed. And, and then on top of that, also now creating a foundation, which was not even an idea before. So do you want to speak a little bit to our program and, and maybe also how the experience supported you to look and see bigger, Katya? Yes, definitely. So part of the uh, preparation that comes with being a part of this program is definitely, um, so you're going to get the physical training and aspect from uh, the organization that is going to be leading the flight. But as far as mental and emotional preparation, that is also very much necessary because your mission here with this flight is to have this overview effect experience. If you're not familiar with the overview effect, then we really encourage you to look it up and learn a little bit more about it because that really is at the root of what we are trying to accomplish. But essentially, you know, it's really important for you to be in a very good mental state and emotional state and just ready and open to have this experience in order to get the full effect, essentially, so that you can then uh, come back and lead some change in the world. But that is not going to happen automatically. For me, it was definitely very interesting to see how some of the goals that I had before, like Rachel said, really measure up to the goals that I have now. And the truth is that they don't at all. And this is a result of two things. One of them, obviously going to space <laughs> and having this incredible experience. But I think that having the experience is not enough because if you're not able to learn how to really deconstruct everything you have gone through, if you're not ready to really allow these different bits of wisdom that are going to just pop in in your mind at the most random hours after this experience as you go on with your life, then you're not really going to be able to really enact the type of change that, that you want to. And this is something that we have heard from several different astronauts who have said that, um, you know, they went to space, they went for a job with NASA or et cetera, and then they come back and they sort of just get thrown into the world like, okay, just go back to your life now. And they feel very lost. They feel very confused because they don't really know what to do with this experience. And it starts to sort of feel like a dream that, that didn't really happen. Um, it starts to take up this part in their mind of, no, that's just, you know, that's just here. That's just, it's somewhere else. And so part of what this program does really well is the integration um, portion, meaning after the flight, how can we actually integrate everything you experienced in order to really come up with some of these life lessons and really come up with some of these different life goals that you might have for yourself. And that is how I was able to come up um, with the solutions that I have, because everything that I've been doing since then has really been a result of I feel very uncomfortable by this idea, or I personally feel like this particular thing, I cannot stop thinking about it, and I cannot stop thinking about how unfair it is, or how terrible it is, or, you know, things like that, and these are things that I had discussed with my integration team um, of how uncomfortable some of these things were making me, and it sort of just reached a point where, with their support, I just said, okay, well, why don't I do something about it? Why don't I, instead of just learning how to be comfortable with these things that I don't like, why don't I actually go and try to change them? So that is really how all of this was, was born. Before the experience, my main goals were in representation for women in STEM and particularly women of color in STEM. So this was in, in a few different ways. This was in larger scale public speaking. Um, this was in representation on television, through the media, through different, doing different uh, TV shows. Um, I had a goal, which I still do, for a book. And so I was very much thinking about things in sort of the things that I knew were approachable to me because they were similar to what I was already doing. And after the experience, my goals although still similar, just became multiplied times a million because I was now seeing so much bigger. And mm -hmm. that's why we really want to encourage you to be as ambitious as, as you want to be when it comes to this, when it comes to your application, when it comes to the plan that you might have for, for changing the world, because you, I trust me, you will need that ambition. And I can guarantee you that if you go through this experience, you will still look at that and go, that was 
still too small. <laughs> mm, I love it. That's amazing. Um, so good. I'm and I'm seeing we're, we have 15 questions now, which is awesome. Um, I'm wondering, Michaela, maybe let's go a little bit more into logistics of, of application. Um, I see one question, can, can the deadline be extended or is it for sure the 15th of November? It is for sure the 15th of November. And um, I think that you all can get that done in time. Um, is there anything in, in here that you're seeing, Michaela, that you want to answer right now? Do you want to answer anything about the time commitment? We've got anonymous attendee says, what's the time commitment? Yeah, absolutely. So after the integration process, there is a life and leadership agreement where um, the citizen astronaut kind of etches out their plans and dreams. And, and there's a lot of flexibility in that as it ebbs and flows, like Katya mentioned, and your dreams are going to probably far, you know, out like reach what your expectations were. Um, but we do ask for monthly check-ins with the team, not just to see how that life and leadership agreement is doing, but how we can support you as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so having those monthly check-ins for a year after flight. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then here's, so we've got two, I've got two here. One came from Christy Akoff and also anonymous and anonymous attendee. They're both acting or asking how much weight does a very active social media presence carry in the selection process? Michaela? It doesn't carry any weight. Mm -hmm. So we really wanted when we were etching out, and I'll go into more detail later about the rubric that we utilize, um, but we wanted to make sure that it was as unbiased as possible. And so there's some people like Katya who have a really social, like an active social media presence before flight, and now it's obviously mm -hmm. skyrocketed, which is beautiful. Um, but there is other people that don't feel comfortable with social media. And so that's not, um, that's not really important. We do look at social media in terms of how it's used mm -hmm. um, because we know it's a powerful tool. So we want to see positive communication if there is active social media. Yeah, exactly. And I will share that in, in a way, the positive part of it is that it shows that you're out there sharing your perspective mm -hmm. and it shows that you you're passionate probably about something and so and, and those are all things that we're looking for it does, the expression of that does not need to be social media but you know that's yeah does that make sense that makes sense and I'll just tag on there that um, there's lots of ways to use and leverage the internet to show off what you're doing and mm -hmm. I say show off purposefully because I think a lot of people who are doing amazing things in the world are hesitant Mm -hmm. um, and so I love seeing an online portfolio or website. Um, I love seeing when you're um, maybe at an event, interactions that you're having, um, you know, and a lot of things related to um, community development and activism is really behind the scenes and a personal one-on-one -on -one connection. So maybe having a blog reflecting that experience rather than taking pictures or things like that, if it's not appropriate, um, is another, another really good way to, to showcase what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then here's a really great question from Christia Cuff um, for you, Michaela. She says that in the application, the questions are phrased in the plural. Is it better to list many experiences or to dive into one or two examples? It's a great, great question. Mm, okay. Well, I think we want to make it as broad as possible for individuals. Mm -hmm. So there might be someone that's done one thing and that thing has really taken over their world. And so that's totally fine. Um, multiple things that, you know, do kind of have a similar theme. I will say having a similar um, theme of what you're up to is important though people have so many passions that they bring, so we wouldn't ever uh, weigh it differently. Um, but we take a lot of time to see who you are. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't want you to think that it's just one form, one time only. Um, and so when we do kind of have that pool of finalists, we do also um, talk with them interact with them. I did see a question that said, you know, can I update? Things have changed. My life has changed. Well, I actually reach out and talk to people and sometimes, you know, master's programs have been completed or, or life events have taken place, or maybe they've had this aha moment because the seed has been planted during writing that application. So I don't want you to think that it's static and, and that's just ended 
the second mm -hmm. you apply. Yeah. Yeah. So to Ian Winiarski, to your question, um, if you have a lot more to share, then please do share it and please submit a second application. Um, I definitely encourage people to save their application on like their own personal files because they're not going to get a copy of it from us once it's submitted. Um, but yeah, you can definitely go in, reapply, um, and we'll, we look at each application separately. So, you know, maybe your first application doesn't make it to the second round, but your second application does. Um, it, it doesn't, it won't impact, it won't, it won't impact that. It only shows us that you're really passionate, which we love. Um, and then there's another question, which we we're going to talk, talk about. So Michaela asked if it is possible to, to be selected with a spinal cord in, injury. Um, and we've gotten questions about, you know, just different sorts of needs that people have, different sorts of disabilities that people have about if they can fly. Um, and, and I'll just share that this is really the beginning of the industry right now. And so right now the technology is being built right now, the way is being paved. Um, and, and I'll let Michaela touch on this a little bit more, but we encourage, we don't care who you are, you know, what your, what your abilities are, where you're from. We want everyone to apply because this is really the moment for us to, to shape what, what this industry is able to do. Um, I will say that we're, because we're vehicle agnostic, which we can also speak to a little bit, um, we'll fly on any vehicle. And so maybe some vehicles allow, you know, certain things and some vehicles don't allow certain things. Um, we cannot, as Space for Humanity, we cannot comment on their modifications as of now, but as I mentioned, we're committed to making this experience accessible to as many people as possible. So um, yeah, this is the moment to do it. And, and we really can shape how this technology is developed. Michaela, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, I absolutely do because I'm so passionate about this question. Um, so please, please, please apply. Some people have asked me, should I wait until all vehicles can fly, um, you know, and, and support me um, through flight? But I want everyone to apply now because I also correlate the data. So if there is um, a demographic that um, currently isn't flying, I can actually leverage that to support with um, advocacy. Right. Um, and I also want to mention that I lead the Inclusion Council, the Space for Humanity Inclusion Council. So we do a number of things, uh, including making sure that Space for Humanity as an organization is inclusive and our programs are inclusive and our selection process is inclusive. But we also really try and um, support the industry in pushing that door even wider open. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Amazing. Um, okay, we've got so many questions. You guys are, I love how active you all are. This is awesome. Um, for age range for applicants, 18 or older, we've had, I mean, William Shatner went to space at 90. So, you know, it's, it's been done. So really anything is possible there. Thanks. Thank you for your question, Anna. Um, Can I chime in on the younger? Sure, absolutely. Okay, so that is also an area that we're doing some advocacy around, um, because right now it is 18 for most like providers, if not all, I believe. Um, and so we're really looking also at ability to give consent for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I would say also that is um, a key aspect that we look for as space for humanity. There's there's no like requirements other than is this individual able to give permission for themselves to fly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and then Katya here, we've got two for you here. Oh my gosh, you guys have some great, great questions here. Um, okay. So this one is from Shainul Paul, and that is how long is the training? And once the mission is done, does the astronaut get to be part of the training for future citizen astronauts? So, um, this this part of because we just sent our first person to space Katya and then our second Sarah just about a month earlier it's early in our program so we're now just going about to have astronauts that can be involved with this process so Katya if you Katya if you just want to comment on that I welcome yeah. that and then the other thing is kind of related um, from Amanda Nguyen she says what is the relationship between space for humanity and the winners after the flight 
um, Katya, if you just want to comment on that as well. And I will just share, as Katya mentioned at the beginning, we're learning so much right now and we're learning, you know, the best way to make this program as powerful as possible. And so, you know, a word, like we just had an hour long meeting with Katya a week and a half ago about, about these sorts of things. So it's currently being built out. Um, and Katya, if you just want to comment on them, I would be grateful for that. Yeah. So when it came to um, Sarah, I was actually able to participate in that process. And part of what was really important for us was that support from me to her, because for Sarah's flight, it was very, very quick. I believe she had like about a, a week she was notified like a week or two weeks before her flight was supposed to happen, which is very, very, very uh, quick. For mine, it was about a little bit over a month, and that still felt like so fast. And so our priority here really was to support her in that. And I was really grateful that I was able to do that as someone that's already gone through it. And I could sort of just be there to guide her, answer any questions. We had a call um, I believe it was a few days before her flight when she was supposed to, no matter but a week before her flight, she was supposed to be heading over to Texas for training. And we were just talking about, you know, the things that like terrified us and not necessarily related to the space flight. Honestly, it was about COVID and like getting COVID and not being able to fly, <laughs> mm, <laughs> which is a very real part. fear. Yeah. The biggest risk. <laughs> yeah. Um, so being able to just help her through that was really uh, beautiful to me. And so it is the plan. It is the plan to be able to actually create a type of community between all of us citizen astronauts so that we can help each other out in all areas, right? Not necessarily only right before their flight, but also afterward of, okay, you want to start this organization that does this, I have some experience starting this other type of organization, but I can give you some tips about maybe where I went wrong or maybe what I wish I would have done at the beginning so that this doesn't happen to you. So the plan here is really to create a community of very um, like socially driven leaders and individuals that are going to just grow together. Um, and we're going to be adding on more people. And kind of the idea here is if you got a hand, you give a hand. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what I'm really excited about this program. And, and I believe part of the question was about the training. So the training for me was about, um, it started immediately pretty much with Space for Humanity. So I did have about a month um, Sarah, because of the nature of her flight, had less time. But the idea here is that you're not just going to be thrown into the, um, you know, the the actual flight training completely blind, completely without anything really to go on. You are going to be able to have the ability to train first through Space for Humanity um, and prepare mentally, emotionally, and all of that, so that you can just be super prepared when you come in for the other aspects of training and for our relationship afterward that's something that we're really still trying to define but the idea here is like I said to be a community I think it's really important for all of us to sort of just help each other um, if I was able to get this opportunity through Space for Humanity, and I am now doing these really big things, then letting people know that this is thanks to Space for Humanity, that's something that's been really important for me, that way they can also grow and they can also send more individuals and they can sort of serve in their, you know, their own data and, and their different things that they're collecting of this is the impact that we've been able to create so that we can also have more funding, more flights, more citizen astronauts. So it really is this like beautiful symbiotic relationship that, that occurs. Um, we are trying to build that community and in building that community between ourselves and with them, it's also going to create a sort of a different type of a relationship for the citizen astronauts in the future. So um, if your fear, for example, is that you are now like, you have sold yourself to space for humanity and you have to be a space for humanity like employee for the rest of your life because of this and that is not the way that it works. Um, you definitely will want to collaborate and, and communicate and do all of these things because you're just so grateful, thankful, and but also excited for the future for other people. Mm -hmm. um, but they definitely work with you and your schedule. Uh, like right now, I am an extremely busy person and they know that, they understand that. So everything that we do, it's always, you know, is this something that you can fit in? This is a relatively low ask. Do you think that you can 
um, perhaps do some of this work. If not, totally fine. Do you have any other ideas of anything that you can do with the current schedule that you have at the moment? So it has been very collaborative and not at all um, that pressure of, oh, I have to do this because they sent me to space. You know, I I've kind of, if there were questions I sensed, that was the concern <laughs> without you actually saying it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Totally. Um, amazing. Thank you, Katya. So, so good. Yeah. And, and I'll just, and I'll add to that. Um, it's been really fun to see Katya, what you've been wanting to do and what Sarah's been wanting to do. Like, it feels like it's, it's been very collaborative and, and that's why that's really important to us that, I mean, that's kind of like, that's how you make a great team is that everyone's doing things that they want to do and that they enjoy. Um, so we've got lots of questions in here. Katya, Michaela, is there anything that you think we should be addressing? Ooh, there is something that I'd like to mention. Um, so uh, kind of touching on that, like, oh, am I locked in? And, and what's the experience like? And you've given so much context, Katya, which is amazing. But when I build out the process, um, I have a background in a few different careers, but one of them was human resources and recruiting. And I was fortunate to work at a company that let me erase everything from recruiting and make it brand new. And when I did that, I thought, what do I want? How would I want to be treated? And why is it so intimidating? So why is it like getting through the door? It's like a gatekeeper experience rather than a, hey, is this a fit for you and a fit for us? Let's see. So I really had that in mind, building it through. And so our touch points with finalists are really tailored to like, let's have a conversation, get to know you. You know, there is nitty gritty when it comes to that, um, you know, going through the rubric and things like that as we go through the many, like hundreds of applications. Um, but those touch points of getting to know one another um, and the process afterwards, I, I really tried to create it. So it is it's a positive experience and people are having fun. Whoops, I was muted. Um, okay, so. What what else, Katya, Michaela? Anything else? I'm I'm still looking at. I have one here, Rachel, that I think we should. Um, and maybe you can speak on it. Sure. So this person says, "What are the odds that a girl or a woman would get selected again, since two women have already been selected, with the selection focused more on taking a man?" Yeah, I, I was actually just thinking of that one too, Katya. Um, okay, this we wanted to go over this. Also, it's a really great question. I mean, so I get messages all the time of people being like. I'm from this country and there's already been so many people from this country that have been to space or I'm this gender or I'm this or I'm that. So why should I apply? You're not going to select me. And Michaela, do you want to respond to that? I would love to. I would yeah. love to. Um, so it is not like we have a hat and we're like, oh, we've got someone from this demographic. Ooh, it's done now. Um, not at all. So the beginning of the process is what I really want to speak to. And um so when we get all of the applications, we look at three main things, okay? It's leadership, community development, and impact. Three things. So really get those in etched in. And we're going to have also a video coming up um, in the future to really go over that. Um, but when it comes to that leadership, community development, and impact, that's what we're looking at through a rubric. And we created that rubric um, with master teachers, as well as guidance from our inclusion council um, to be really spanning different careers, life experiences. So when we look at, I call it LCDI, Leadership Community Development and Impact, we look at what that is. Is it a niche? Is it, you know, we're looking at what you're up to, what you're doing. And then are you leading that what, right? Um, are you bringing others to that what? Community development. Um, and does that what positively impact the world around you? Um, so the impact, those, those are the three. So once we, we look at those three, then we have our pool of finalists, okay? And at the beginning, I did want to hold space for uh, communities that have been previously not included in the space industry and have not flown. But what was really interesting was that in the last two rounds, the pool was representing a lot of demographics that have not flown. And I found that really interesting in, in really taking a look at applicants 
and talking to applicants, because the door has been so firmly shut for a lot of people, they're making their own opportunities. They're building their own companies. They're doing a lot of volunteer work. They're passionate because there weren't opportunities. So they're giving back to their community members, right? Mm. Um, so right now we look at those three things, leadership, community development, and impact. There is no way that we are going to be looking specifically for gender or demographics. Um, I think it's amazing. And we're at a time that is a lot of firsts are happening, um, but that's not what we're looking for. It's just an amazing byproduct that comes out. Mm hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Um, what else? We've got 20 questions in here. Katya, Michaela, anything, anything in here that you want to answer right now? I just really want to reiterate that this is open to everyone all over the world. Um, I think that this has been, you know, like pretty common for most people that come from certain countries that don't really have a space program for them to just automatically assume that certain opportunities, especially since Space for Humanity is based out of the U.S., that it won't be open to them since that door has been shut in their face for so, so long. And that is a very common question that I get. Do you need U.S. citizenship in order to apply for Space for Humanity? And the answer is not at all. You can apply. You don't even have to be living in the United States. You can apply from anywhere in the world. Um, I believe the first application rounds that we did, there were applicants from um, 120 countries that were representing. So definitely don't feel um, like if you're not a U.S. citizen that you won't be able to qualify or apply. It's open to absolutely everyone. I mean, Sarah, the second citizen astronaut that was selected is from Egypt. So mm -hmm. definitely open to, to everyone. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and then we got a question from someone who's who's going to be 18 years old, three days after the application closes. That's totally fine. And we're going to, we'll review your application when you're 18. So you're good. Um, so we got this one. What, what else, what else should we be talking about? Michaela and Katya. There is one that I saw of an applicant that claims they have, where is it? I can't find it, but I, they said something about, um, different types of, conditions physical conditions I believe they mentioned that they have other oh, is health issues yeah. um they mentioned Women, that they the have women's health one yes they have yeah. endometriosis um so I would just like to share on that I actually personally have endometriosis um endometriosis is something that one in 10 women have I believe around the world and for me what I've been able to do about it um I've been doing a lot of research particularly endometriosis as it applies to to space um back in the day during the shuttle days endometriosis was actually a cause for um dismissal if you were to have that and you wanted to be an astronaut so if you you know, we're very close in the process. And then during your medical checks, they found out you had endometriosis, they would send you home. Uh, but that was back in the shuttle days when they didn't really have a good, clear understanding of this. That has actually changed, um, particularly when it comes to NASA. It is now on a case-by-case -case basis. And primarily what they want to know is, is it treated? Is it under control? Um, you know, what exactly is it? Like, how is it representing in you? So what I have done actually... Um, is that I have a gynecologist that I see every six months. And here the goal is, you know, to just keep an eye on it. How is it doing? Um, uh, and at the same time, when it comes to my flight medicals, this is something that I work very closely regarding the flight medical um, certificate um, that I get of letting them know about this, letting them see everything that I have. And then they can be the ones to decide like, oh yeah, this is you know, this is a non-issue. So um, things like that are definitely uh, still when it comes to space on a case by case basis. But when it comes to this particular opportunity, since the space flight, you're not going to be up there for like months when that would actually be an issue. And so as mm -hmm. far as some of the current providers go, they sort of leave that choice up to you. Um, you sign your contract, you sign your paperwork that you're making yourself responsible for you know, certain choices that you're making. Um, but yes, I just wanted to, to share that and touch on that because I personally also have that and I was able to do this experience. I was checked before, checked after, everything is still perfect. <laughs> you're muted, mm -hmm. Rachel. 
I hate it when that happens. Um, yeah. And, and I will say that I didn't even, I didn't know that. And thank you for sharing Katya. And cause we don't need to know that, you know, like if, it's, if you can go to space for 11 minutes and it won't impact your health, whatever the, you know, health conditions are, then we've got no issue over here. And, and ultimately, you know, that's something to disclose to blue or to whatever the flight provider, whoever the flight provider is. Um, Gabriela Garcia asked, in case of not being selected, could you let us know the reasons behind that feedback in order to know what to improve and apply again with better chances for being selected? So I'll say, I think that we've covered really what we were looking for pretty closely. Um, but I can add, and maybe Michaela, if you want to add to this, feel free. Like there's some really basic things that's gonna like gonna have us spend more time on your application. And like, for example, um, we have a word count. Try and get somewhere near that, you know, like really take it seriously. Edit your grammar and your spelling. Like just do your best to like take the application really seriously and spend your spend your time on it. And that will make in be, when that happens, we will spend more time reviewing as well. Michaela, do you have anything to add? Well, actually, um I had a feeling. I had a feeling yeah. you're gonna have to push back to whatever yeah. I said. <laughs> So the rubric is created by master teachers who yeah. look at assessment and for, shout out to the teachers here um, because assessment is, is so important. And so we actually don't look um, at any grammatical errors. Um, now, the passion that is infused through com like communication is amazing. Um, so I would say, you know what, read it to your friends. Be like, does this like show where my passion is? Does this make me sparkle if someone was reading this? And I did see a question that said, what if it's not really my strength? And that's okay, because Rachel, you know, it's not my strength. I don't either. like to write. It's not for me. Let's have a conversation. Um, so, you know, really taking the time to craft something that if consumed, you know, really shows who you are, I think is, is what you were getting at there. Um, but it's okay. We're not looking at, at spelling errors or gram grammatical errors or things like that. Yeah. And, and um, thanks for answering that, Michaela. I'll say that I'm not the reviewer. I'm not the reviewer of these. So don't take my advice. Can I give a little bit of context as well to the behind the scenes? Sure. Okay. So like I mentioned, we've got that amazing rubric that we use as like a, a really great guide. And then we have teachers come in and we train those teachers on unbiased assessment. It, they probably already have, if they're in our group of teachers that we're working with, um, a background in that, but we just make sure everyone's on the same page. We make sure that if you see an application and I see an application, we're gonna be marking it in a similar manner, okay? Um, to really create that uh, equity in looking through applications. Then after that, we'll probably have about a, a pool of 20. All right. And I say pool a lot of times because they are not ranked because that's not what we're about here. We're looking for, is it the fit for you, the fit for us? Um, so I'll say everyone in that 20, like amazing. Um, but then we take a look a little bit deeper into, again, maybe, a, you know, social media presence. Is there anything negative going on? Um, are there any, you know, risks that we would be taking? Um, so, you know, we, we take a little dig. Um, and so that's another thing is, you know, make sure that you've got a, a positive presence in the world yeah. um, because you're going to be representing not just yourself, but us as well. Yeah. Um, and then after that 20, um, it really comes to light. Um, you know, we take time with the applications. We get to know. Also, we do a really big dig on the Internet of like who you are. And then I'll have a conversation. Who are you? You know, tell us a little bit more information. Um, and then from there we will have a, a interview process and we will do interviews with four people. Um, and so not just are, there, are they able to retouch on the leadership, community development and impact, but then we focus more on like, what will this experience mean for you? Logistically, are you ready? And it's, I actually had a conversation with someone who was in the top and they weren't ready mm. and that's okay. Um, because we want we want to be at the time that you're ready and, you know, because this is a really big change in people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, so we look at resiliency as well during that time. Um, and, uh, 
And so as Katya said, it, we do also try and keep from the time you're contacted to decision-making a really quick time because there's a lot of anxiety during that time. Um, and so we also want to keep that, keep that down as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Michaela. Super clear. Um, and then M M is it Mikhail, maybe Mikhail or Mikhail, um, or maybe it's Michael. Um, let me, let me know in the comments how I can pronounce your name. Um, Beskov, will you, will you add operators outside of the U S? Um, we are vehicle agnostic, as I mentioned, and currently we have partnerships with Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, Worldview, and Space Perspective. Um, and yeah, we're uh, being that we're vehicle agnostic, you know, we're open for whatever provider when they're ready and safe. So um, I do know of Zero to Infinity. I actually haven't heard of these companies out of France, so I'll have to look into them. Thank you for your comment. I have one I wanted to cover because um, it came yeah. up a couple of times on here. So some people are asking whether there are any opportunities within Space for Humanity for volunteer work or maybe internships. Um, however, I do want to add on to that, that if the answer is yes, would that create a sort of like ethics issue um, in them wanting to apply for this opportunity? Sorry, can you can you repeat that, Katya? I, I, yeah, will you just repeat that? Yes. So the question was uh, whether there are any opportunities within Space for Humanity for anyone to volunteer or maybe any internship possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, and then just my add on, if they were to go ahead and do that, would that maybe open the door for any ethics issues since now you would personally know this individual? Absolutely. Michaela, do you want to take this one? Oh, yeah, I absolutely do, because we want our community to be active and, and join us, but not have to step away from being possibly selected. So we looked at this and you can absolutely volunteer with us um, and then also apply. Um, now, because uh, as well, like I said, it's teachers, it's not us, it's not us pulling all nighters going through all of all of the different applications. Um, so people who will be looking at the applications wouldn't have worked with you per se. Um, and so that's really okay. Um, we do, however, have some kind of asterisks there um, because we would uh, want to have that individual then take a step away um, during that final phase. Um, but if you did volunteer work, let's say for SBCA, and you did volunteer work for Space for Humanity, that would be considered the same, right? Um, however, people that couldn't apply working with Space for Humanity would be like me, uh, Rachel, as well as our board members. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I still think we should send you guys, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be a team bonding experience. Yeah, <laughs> like those little camps that they do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, well, we're definitely approaching the hour. Katia, Michaela, is there any other questions that you want to answer in here? Um, um, you know, I, I think I just really wanted to stress because I saw this come up and I've been asked it a few times is, um, are we only sending folks from the space industry? Mm -hmm. Now, no, no. But I will say because of our reach in our current community, there are a lot of people who apply from the space industry and science fields. Um, and so, you know, I think that really I want people to be sharing this with other communities, right? Sharing this with your peers, with your friends. We want to make sure that this just gets out there to a wider audience. So we've got till November 15th. Um, and, you know, I think it's so important for not just you to apply, but you just share it in your circles. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, so, um, what are potential social, social media red flags, Michaela? Yeah, um, great question. So I'm absolutely not looking for, is this good or bad, or it's a binary. I go back to, and we go back to in the rubric when we're looking at this, because we actually use a rubric when looking at social media. I'm not like, oh, didn't love that post. No, it's it's really looked at from, um, is this post spreading hate within the world? Like it would be very heavy um, uh, things that would be posted. 
Um, and so opinions and things like that, um, when it's not related to actively spreading hate, it, it, that's not what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, absolutely we understand that social media um, is a tool for communication. And, and so we're not like nitty gritty going through your entire life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then there's another question about when, when will everyone hear back? Um, I would say probably within eight months, if you, if you make it to round two, you'll find out within eight months. Um, and that all, that's all the information that we can give right now. Can I add in another question that we actually had from Instagram? Yeah. Um, and this has been brought up a few times is the misconception that people are paying the citizen astronauts have to pay, mm. um, or there's a partial payment or maybe, um, you know, flights to and from are on them. So, um, Rachel, if you want to maybe give some context to that. Um, can you don't confirm have to... anything Rachel says. <laughs> Just put that out there. What did you say, Katya? You can confirm. But I can confirm anything yeah. you say about this. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's, why have, that's why we have Katya here. Um, so yeah, we you we pay for your flight, we pay for your training, you know, we pay for all the things. Um, we pay for your travel, we we totally cover it. So the, the goal is to really make this accessible for anyone, whether you know, no matter no matter what. Um and in terms of your impact program afterwards, it's it's kind of a, that's a different thing that's been really stewarded separately um, with both Katya and Sarah. But in terms of resources that we have there, we have a ton, we, we, um, we have a ton of, you know, advisors and connections and support that we can help you with there. Um, and then we also spend some time around your flight. We you know, hand over our PR lead and let you work directly with her and she will manage all your communications with the news media, we'll train you. So our goal is to just prep you and support you as much as we possibly can and all of it. Um, and also like fill in any knowledge gaps that you might not have, you know, maybe you just fell in love with space last year. And so you're just learning about what's happening in the industry or, you know, maybe you've never been interviewed on by a news channel before and and so our goal is through our program to be able to support you to fill in any of those gaps as well and i'm seeing lots of thank yous and um yeah a acknowledgement that we're doing a great job from mikhail thank you everyone for your kind words we we're really grateful to get to i can speak for myself in saying i am really grateful and i think the team and Katia as well, mm -hmm. just so grateful to get to work on such an incredible yes. mission and, and also to have such a passionate community around us, like, you know, like seeing all of your curiosities and your questions. And, you know, I love that there's people that aren't even 18 that are here. You know, we just, we want to do everything that we can to support you all and being able to gain this perspective, whether, whether you're our next citizen astronaut or, you know, you, you're a follower, just following the media. Um. Michaela, Katya, anything to add? I have a really, I have a good one here, um, sure. which I think might be from Michaela. Um, so it says, I understand that Chinese citizens are banned from flights on U.S. space suborbital suborbital operators. Do you accept applicants from China or Russian um, or any of these other countries that might have some conflicts with the U.S.? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, we take. I'll just, I can expand on that. We take applications from everywhere. Um, like I said, it doesn't really matter where you're from. Everyone goes through the same funnel and um, yeah. And so we don't mm -hmm. care, you know, disability status, gender, where you're from. We, we take applications from. Yeah. I, I will just say to, to add on to that. Um, so from the previous um finalist round that we did essentially the way that space for humanity does it and i think that it's so beautiful is that their different metrics make it so that you're not going to be discounted for disability or where you come from or who you are anything like that and so some of the people that we actually had um all the way at the end were individuals that um, come from some of these different backgrounds and so now 
now that the work is on space for humanity for for example if it's a type of person that hasn't flown before to space then going to the different providers and saying look i have this type of person is this something that we can work together to try to make it happen um but just because you have a disability or just because you come from maybe one of these countries doesn't mean that you know round one everyone's going to just automatically um put your application aside you will make it to the end um you can make it to the end and not necessarily you know like it has nothing to do with any of these things so i think that's really beautiful to to see and if the providers aren't ready yet um you still made it to the end you were still a finalist and you are still right there um, sort of in the in wait for the opportunity to become available through the technology so i also wanted to say that Mm -hmm. Exactly. Leadership, community development, and impact. We don't look at any other aspect of your application. In fact, it's hidden. Mm -hmm. So I really want to stress that. Um, as Katya mentioned, later down the road, you know, if there are logistical issues, you know, we would discuss them. Um, and it is so case by case. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, you guys have so many questions. It's amazing. We're at 36 open questions and we're I know, just I'm trying to close them if we've already <laughs> answered them so we can see the rest um yeah. there is there is one I wanted to look at but I just lost it um oh yes so this one is particularly uh dealing with the actual application this person says question 30 asks for permission to post content of the application publicly to what extent is this and will declining this affect the application it wouldn't affect the application. It would just be with the media rollout. Yeah. From what so I just, remember, it was like the little quotes that would be posted. Yeah, the media, media rollout of, of introducing the next CA to the world. Um, but yeah, we're also very, um, you know, cognizant that we want to make sure as we roll you out into that amazing, exciting time of CA3, um, that we ask you how you want to be represented, how you want to, you, uh, sorry, represent yourself, how, what information you'd want to share or not share. Um, there have been individuals, you know, that as we're nearing that, those end stages that, you know, we talk about, you know, how and different things that they would want to share because there is a lot of media that come. Um, and so we plant that seed really early. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. Well, I think with that, we'll close up and so sorry, we did not get to answer all of your questions and, but yeah, we're, we're getting just, better at it though. We're getting, we're getting better. That. that was a lightning round. We're going quick now. Yeah. Um, we answered 41 questions. So that's pretty good. Actually. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's a pretty high stat. I should, I'll share that with the board. Um, Anyways, so just wanted to end with saying thank you to everyone for being here. We're so grateful for your support. I know probably some of you have been with us since we were founded in 2017 and have probably watched us grow throughout the years and um, and maybe some joined in this year after seeing the headlines with Katya and Sarah. Um, but either way, just the biggest, biggest thank you to all of you for being here and for your support and um, for sharing this mission because really this is what whether or not you go to space, whether or not I go to space, whether or not any of us go to space, this is about a much greater perspective and about how this perspective can make much bigger change in our world. Um, I think you all know by now that Einstein quote of, we can't solve the problems we've created with the same level of thinking that created them. And so what we care about is just helping people see bigger and, and experience that overview, that overview effect. Um, because we believe that can contribute to a, a much more like a promising future for humanity. Um, one thing I'll add is I did put in the chat. Um, I think, oh, wait, hold on. Nope. I got to, I'm putting in the chat right now. If anybody wants to learn more about the overview effect. Oh, it looks like I can't send it. Ben, do you mind? Can you send this to everybody? I just put it in the chat. Um, so there's a, there's a page on our website where you can learn more about the overview effect. And there's also an incredible film. It's in the chat right now. There's an incredible film called Overview. It's 20 minutes long and it's got a number of our advisors and the astronauts on our board all speaking about this experience. And like the, those seeds that we're planning that we talk about, we all can be those seeds right now, much before we ever go to space. So I invite you all to take a look at that. 
Um, and if you want to support, I know I saw a lot of questions about volunteering or interning or getting involved. Um, you know, what you can do right now is just share that we have our, our applications open and, you know, maybe share how this webinar was for you and share it with your friends and let them know that they can also apply here. Um, and then in terms of volunteering in the future, I think we will we'll be opening up applications for that at some point as well. And we've got lots of ideas and and we really want to, as Michaela said, like steward your passion and, and have you all be involved. So yeah, we're so grateful. Thank you all. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, Michaela, for your time and for answering everyone's questions. Um, is there anything that you both want to say in closing? I just want to say thank you to everyone that was here. Sorry for my typing. I was replying to your questions, <laughs> um, the ones that we didn't get to. Uh, I just want to encourage everybody to please apply. Just apply. If you're not selected this time around, apply again. Um, definitely feel free to reach out for any feedback from any of us. We would love to help you make sure this application is what you want it to be. So um, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, trusting in Space for Humanity. And I think we can do some really amazing work together. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Michaela? Oh. Yes, so thank you for everyone being here. And, um, you know, as we said, this program, it has been evolving and is evolving. And so we are getting better at, at being able to answer your questions and provide more transparency into the process. So, you know, we have been starting to do some lives on Instagram and I'd really encourage people to uh, also subscribe to our, um, our newsletter to get other updates, you know, and things like that. So thank you so much. And the questions that we haven't answered, we'll make sure that, that we try and address those on social media. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Thank you, everybody. Have an amazing Thursday. Bye-bye. Okay.